I don't know how many people are familiar with, with James Connolly, but uh, very briefly, he was born in 1848 in Edinburgh and grew up uh, receiving his training as a socialist labor leader in Scotland. His parents had immigrated from Ireland uh, in the post-famine years. He found himself uh, both a, a leader in the, the workers' struggle in the United Kingdom at that time and then moved to moved to Ireland, to Dublin, Ireland, as an organizer, and uh, became a, a major figure in, in Irish labor history, forming the Irish Socialist Republican Party in 1896. Uh, the significance of this is twofold. One is that it was really the, the introduction of socialism into Irish politics for the first time. And the second is the program of this party, which I'm going to read a little excerpt from since it very clearly and eloquently uh, shows the relevance of Connolly to this day. Um, but Connolly later wrote a book called Labor in Irish History, which was actually a path-breaking historical work um, that it gained him the notoriety uh, that brought him to the United States in 1902 to go on a speaking tour, which brought him from New York. I believe he actually spoke in Rochester. I know he spoke in Buffalo, Chicago, and San Francisco. He returned to Ireland at that, at that time, uh, only to emigrate to the United States in 1903, looking for work because he was such a renowned figure he couldn't find any work in, in the British Isles. Uh, his whole family then came with him, uh, joined him in New York. And in 1905, with, with the formation of the Industrial Workers of the World, he joined the Industrial Workers of the World and, was, and participated in many of the early battles of the IWW. In 1907, in New York, he published uh, the, so the Songs of Freedom, which is the subject of this book, our new book. Uh, this book was, it was edited by Connolly. It contained nine songs that he, or nine lyrics that he wrote, and nine by other Irish authors. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later because that book lay dormant or unread for almost a hundred years. Uh, he then later returned to Ireland in 1910 and joined with Jim Larkin in the formation of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, which went on to lead the first major industrial battle in Irish history, which was called the Dublin Lockout. It was commemorated last year throughout, throughout the year and throughout Ireland. This was a major conflict involving mainly the transport workers, the, uh, the, the dock workers in Dublin, and it was brutally suppressed by the, the ruling elites of Dublin. But it was a pivotal battle for a number of reasons, not the least of which was that in the Dublin lockout, Connolly and his comrades formed the Irish Citizen Army to protect the workers from the attacks of the police. And the Irish Citizen Army went on to uh, play a very crucial role, in fact, a pivotal role in the Easter Rising of 1916, for which Connolly was subsequently executed at Kilmainham Jail in Dublin by the British. That's just a very brief overview so that you have some sense of where the, what Connolly's signif significance was, not only in Ireland, for which, of course, he's most famous, but also in Scotland, in England, and in the United States. Now what prompted us to do this project was that uh, when I turned 60 in 2011, I decided that because my birthday happened to be July 14th, the inaugural battle of the great French Revolution, that I would like to celebrate my birthday by singing revolutionary songs. And as many of my friends are Irish, uh, I decided we should concentrate on Irish songs. Irish revolutionary songs, of which there are thousands, literally thousands, and they span at least 200 years. And um, the two closest uh, collaborators in this project with me, Joe McHugh and Alan Burke, both reside in Ireland, quickly, as we began assembling the repertoire, uh, quickly began to focus more and more on the figure of James Connolly. And that was partly for personal reasons, partly for political reasons, 
and partly because Connolly represents something very important in, the, in today's Irish struggle, not to mention internationally. And that was easy for me because I had grown up uh, in a, a Connolly household in San Francisco. I knew a lot about him, but the truth was I never knew any of the songs that he, he actually wrote. In fact, I didn't actually know he wrote any songs. All I knew was this famous quote, which someone here today mentioned, is on the wall of the Starry Plow in Berkeley and has been quoted many, many times. No revolutionary movement is complete without its poetic expression. If such a movement has caught hold of the imagination of the masses, they will seek a vent in song for the aspirations, fears, and hopes, the loves and hatreds engendered by the struggle. Until the movement is marked by the joyous, defiant singing of revolutionary songs, it lacks one of the most distinctive marks of a popular revolutionary movement. It is the dogma of the few and not the faith of the multitude. That quote has been circulated widely. It's one of the few things that uh, almost everybody knows that Connolly wrote. What I didn't know was that that was taken from Songs of Freedom. That's actually how Songs of Freedom begins, the original Songs of Freedom. is the opening line, or opening lines. I found that out later. But when we decided we wanted to do these songs, uh, we needed to find them. And in this day, age of the internet and so on, I thought, well, this is gonna be pretty easy. we we'll just go on YouTube and find James Connolly songs. Or find the James Connolly songbook, find Songs of Freedom, no problem. There was a problem. I reached a guy in rare and, collect, rare and collect, collectible books in County Mayo, and he told me, you're not gonna find it. And I said, why not? And he said, because there's only one copy in existence, and it's sitting in the National Library in Dublin, and you can't take it out. And I said, but we need these songs, man. I gotta have these songs. And he said, well, there just so happens to be another songbook, which was printed by the Cork Workers Club in 1972 called the James Connolly Songbook. And as a matter of fact, it contains as many of the songs that Connolly ever wrote that anyone knows about. So if you can find that on the internet, then buy that, you can work with that, and that's what we did. I ordered that from a London bookseller and we just started to work. But we discovered a number of problems almost immediately. One was that there was no music. Um, there were only a few of the tunes that actually said to the tune of, uh, and some of those tunes were pretty obscure and came in various different styles and, and you know, there was a melodic content but it wasn't clear what Connolly intended to do. But we set to work anyway because we were em empowered by two things that came out of this, of the songbook itself, this James Connolly songbook which had a, an introduction uh, written by the Cork Workers Club. And it, one was that Connolly did not put his lyrics to anything traditional, not even Irish. He used popular songs of the day, whether they were Scottish or English or Irish or, or American for that matter. Anything he could get his hands on because his criteria was that he wanted the workers to sing these songs. And if they were already if familiar with the melodies, then great, they, they would join in singing all the, all the easier. The second thing was that uh, as, as the introduction to the James Connolly songbook said, melodies and, and tunes pass into, uh, you know, into the fog of memory. Uh, the lyrics are timeless and should be sung to the contemporary music of, the, of young workers today. So we felt like, okay, there's, there's nothing wrong with writing our own music. We just have to make the song singable and uh, a pleasure to, to uh, listen to. So that's what we did. And when we were done with the forming the repertoire and we had this great party, it was a wonderful thing. I thought we were done, but uh, Alan and Joe insisted we were not done. That given the grave crisis facing the Irish people due to the collapse of the Celtic Tiger and the, the, uh, the depredations of capitalism, uh, it was important that we bring this out. And I said, well, I'm all for bringing it out, but we can't just do that. We, we need to do some research. We need to find out where the re, you know, what's in the real Songs of Freedom. What's the, what's the difference between Songs of Freedom and the James Connolly songbook? 
And so I went to, went to Dublin and I looked at the Songs of Freedom and it was a revelation because not only was this quote in it, but there was an entire half of the introduction that I'd never seen, I'd never heard of, had no idea about, which said that this songbook was published in the United States and dedicated to the American working class as a contribution of Irish authors to the socialist poetry of the world. And so I thought, well, this demands closer examination. Why hasn't anybody seen this thing? Why hasn't anybody undertaken to republish this book? Um, because it was, it was obviously an interesting historical document just as a historical document, let alone in terms of Connolly's lyrics or, or the, the lyrics of other writers, other Irish authors. And uh, in, in pursuing the, you know, the research further, I actually went back to San Francisco because I have a lot of Irish friends there, Irish American friends, people that have been involved with labor and Irish issues for, for many, many years. And at a talk I gave there, basically to raise funds and find out more, a guy put me in touch with another guy named Jim Lane in Cork, Ireland. And I called Jim and I said, you don't know me, but I'm working on this project. I've, I've, we're going to try to re republish Songs of Freedom. And he said, uh, and I said, I, I, I've been using the, the, the Cork Workers Club James Connolly songbook and I've been told that you were involved with that. And well, he said, well, yes, I was a bit involved with it. I wrote the introduction. And I said, oh, you wrote the introduction. And he said, yes, and as a matter of fact, I have something else you have to see. So he was kind enough to send me a, a scanned copy of the 1919 Souvenir Program, which had been published at a commemorative concert held in Dublin in 1919, about which the Cork Workers Club, Jim Lane himself, had written in the introduction of the James Connolly Songbook. And this concert was extremely important. First of all, it was commemorating Connolly's bir birth three years after his execution. It was put under the Domain of the Realm Act by the British government, meaning it was forbidden. The British Army came to attack the concert. The concert was defended by the ICA and other workers. So there was a pitched battle going on outside while inside were being sung the joyous, defiant, revolutionary songs of which Connolly was a contributor. And when I saw this document, I realized this whole story has to be told. This cannot just be a, a CD of some songs that we put together and maybe a republication of Songs of Freedom, but we had to republish Songs of Freedom, the 1919 Souvenir Songbook, and the James Connolly Songbook to bring the whole story together and make available to people right now what has been unavailable all these years. Now, to return once, quickly before we, we start singing these songs, to, to Connolly's original program and his relevance to today, I just would like to quickly read from the Irish Socialist Republican Party's program written by Connolly in 1896. Object, establishment of an Irish Socialist Republic based upon the public ownership by the Irish people of the land and instruments of production distribution and exchange. Agriculture to be administered as a public function under boards of management elected by the agricultural population and responsible to them and to the nation at large. All other forms of labor necessary to the well-being of the community to be conducted on the same principles. Program, as a means of organizing the forces of the democracy in preparation for any struggle which may precede the realization of our ideal or paving the way for its realization, or restricting the tide of migration by providing employment at home, and finally, of palliating the evils of our present social system, we work by political means to secure the following measures. One, nationalization of railways and canals. Two, abolition of private banks and money lending institutions and establishment of state banks under popularly elected boards of directors issuing loans at cost. Three, establishment at public expense of rural depots for the most improved agricultural machinery to be lent out to the agricultural population at a rent covering cost in the management alone. Four, graduated income tax 
on all incomes over 400 pounds per annum in order to pro provide funds for pensions to the aged, infirm, and widows and orphans. Five, legislative restriction of hours of labor to 48 per week and establishment of a minimum wage. Six, free maintenance for all children. Seven, gradual extension of the principle of public ownership and supply to all the necessities of life. Eight, public control and management of national schools by boards elected by popular ballot for that purpose alone. Nine, free education up to the highest university grades. 10, universal suffrage. That program is exactly what would have solved the problem that the Irish people are facing now. Had the abolition of private banks alone been implemented, the problem that the Irish people are facing today would not be faced. So, that's for me uh, uh, an introduction to what, what Connolly is and was and what his relevance is today. And we return to the, the, the music now to the, that we'd like to perform for you because that was our way of being introduced to that program. And that's exactly the pr procedure we'd like to see happen. People be drawn in by the music and then go and read Connolly for themselves. In choosing all the, these songs, uh, we, we tried to choose as wide a range of uh, lyrics as possible because Connolly naturally wrote many militant marching songs, but he also wrote a festive song. Comrades, glass pans, the time demands this night we spend enjoying the jovial word round festive board and carcass. Liquor this night shall sparkle bright with homage paid the beauty. And brave men who of conflict do shall take a rest from duty. Then fill a cup of liquor, oh, let every man his neighbor. That in the light of truth he'll fight to be. Have taken root, and soon the fruit our tyrants shall discover. And when at length we shall strength and send each desper flying with joy and mirth like ours, the air shall hail a fresh undying. Then fill the cup and liquor around, touch every man his neighbor that in the light of truth. Shall not the best, but be who laughs the longest. And in the fight with strong and right, the laugh is with the strongest. Since time began, fate's mighty plan, the laugh gave to the proudest. But history shall tell, and we laugh, laugh the loudest. Then fill the cup with liquor. That in the light of truth you try to win the world for Then comrades toast, great freedom's host, and loudly sing her praises. And on it be all land and sea who our banner raises. So air will leave a wreath, the wave of flowers of earth best to lean in. Perhaps some of you here will remember that uh, 
Connolly wrote, we only want the earth, because this line appeared in other places and mastheads of newspapers, it's been quoted many times, but the actual name of the song is Be Moderate. <laughs> Whene'er they speak that we demand too much Tis past and strange and I declare Such statements cause me mirth For our demands most modest Ah, oh, we only want the earth Be moderate the timorous cry who dread the tyrant's thunder you ask too much and people fly from you aghast in a wonder tis past and strange and i declare such statements cause me mirth for our demands most muttered oh, we only want the earth Our masters all the godly crew whose hearts throb for the poor Their sympathy the sure us too if our demands were few Most generous souls but please observe what they enjoy from birth Is all we ever have the nerve to ask that is the earth. The labor fuck here, full of guile, such doctrine ever preaches. And whilst he bleeds, the rank and file tame moderation teaches. He had in his despite, we'll see the day when a with sword in its skirt. Labor shall march in war array to seize its own at the earth. For labor long with groans and tears to its oppressors knelt, but never yet to all say fears did hear of tyrant melt. We need not is high of true men there's no dearth and our victorious rally and cry shall be we want the earth <laughs> This next song <clears throat> actually did have work, uh, music to it. Uh, it was listed as um, to the tune or the air of Clare's Dragoons, which is an 18th century Irish song. Uh, and we found numerous versions of this, ranging from a slow melancholic dirge all the way up to a very rapid jig without any singing to it, actually just a dance song. Uh, and as you've already heard, uh, Connolly's lyrics are very literary and uh, a real mouthful to sing. So in order to make this singable, we had to find the proper tempo. This is called Human Freedom. You want to sing? Yes, I'd like to invite you to sing along with a couple of words in the chorus. You can just sing what I sing, which is shout hurrah for freedom. Again, shout hurrah. And the last line is, freedom spark shall ride the storm. But shout hurrah for freedom, shout hurrah would already be marvelous. <laughs>
Come harken all the day draws nigh When mustering host of cause shall try A laborer's right to live and die Enjoying human freedom Then labor's force shall take the field The liberating sword to wield For labor's own right arm must shield The cause of the human freedom for freedom's host, for freedom's banner, no be born. Shout hurrah, oh damn, because freedom's bar shall ride the storm. The lights our heroes' lives have bought, the truths our martyrs dying taught. The hearts of men with passion hot, prepare for human freedom. Its roots are in no barren soil, but watered by the tears of toil, are spreading fast. No storm can spoil the plant of human freedom. So shout hurrah for freedom's for freedom, freedom. Freedom's bark shall ride the storm. Our native land, alas, the name is but a sound to tell our shame. What land have they whose spirits tame the loss of human freedom? When lake and river, hill and dale, hear children's cry and women's wail of suffering rise on every gale. For that human freedom so shout hurrah for freedom's host for freedom better no be born so shout hurrah oh dear because freedom's bark shall ride the storm our banner waves over many bands through mountain Ocean severed lands with active brain and skillful hands of fighting for human freedom. For ancient feuds no more divide, and ancient hates we thrust aside. Our class we know through battle's tide must bear the flag of freedom. For this since the world began, their troubled course. The ages ran, and earth in long travail for man, bear seed of human freedom. For us and ours that heritage was handed down from age to age, that we might write on history's page the birth of human freedom. So shout hurrah for freedom, for freedom. You also have to keep in mind that there were nine musicians in the band, well and pipes, whistles, fiddles, accordions, and so on, so we're doing the best we can, <laughs> and you're helping us out. This next song uh, was included in the repertoire on the CD because we wanted people who are, were completely unfamiliar with Connolly to have some idea of the regard in which he was held, both by his contemporaries and by the subsequent <laughs> generations. Um, this, is, this song was actually written to a traditional Irish tune. Uh, the lyrics are by Dominic Bean, who is Brendan Bean's brother. Uh, and it includes two very important stanzas, which bear explanation. Uh, one line is, now William Martin Murphy and his Dublin millionaires. And this is a reference to the Dublin lockout, 
because William Martin Murphy was the leader of the, you might say, the, the Dublin bourgeoisie and was a, a pu very public figure and hated by all the workers. The second uh, reference is, and when the bosses tried to sweat the lads down on Glasgow's Clyde, and this is a very important reference, and it was really brought to my attention when we launched the book in Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, where I was introduced by uh, a fine author by the name of Jim Kelman, who uh, emphasized uh, Connolly's role in Scotland in the, in the socialist labor movement of, of Scotland and his importance to the Scots as a figure. Um, in, in some ways, there's a certain pride there that <laughs> he's ours, <laughs> that kind of thing, as much as being an Irish uh, or internationalist leader. And there are references in that stanza to the, the various places that Connolly was a, uh, a leading figure. This is called Connolly Was There. began to crack in farm and field and factory and workshop mine and rail the flame was lit a beacon bright that flame is burning still Connolly was there Connolly was there brave old undaunted James Connolly was there Connolly, James Connolly Connolly was there Connolly was there Connolly now William Martin Murphy and his Dublin millionaires Try bribery, corruption, hypocrisy and fear To break the workers' unity, scabs they didn't list But all their graft was shattered by a scarlet iron fist Yet St. Connolly was there A voice like roar and thunder shook them in their stride In Liverpool and Belfast when the worker lives in hell Connolly rose and gave them hope, the truth to you I'll tell Oh, I was there, Connolly was there Brave, bold, undaunted James Connolly He wrote it in 1903, and unbeknownst to us, he had set it to music by a comrade of his by the name of Gerald Crawford. And um, some people have asked along the way, 
whether or not the workers actually sang these songs. And this song undoubtedly was sung by the, the masses of workers in Scotland, uh, perhaps elsewhere as well. Uh, and it's, we, we did not know that there was music to it. This was again, it appeared in the James Connolly songbook just as a text. We found out later when we saw the 1919 uh, souvenir program that there was actually music to it and there was actually this uh, peculiar tablature which we had no idea what it meant until last year on a visit to uh, Pete Seeger to talk to him about this project. He immediately recognized it as the tablature that was used by Christian missionaries to teach songs to uh, the heathen savages. Anyway, uh, it was obviously the way people, learn, uh, people who are not literate in music uh, could read, and, and by that time in Dublin, obviously the workers at, the, at, the, at this uh, great program were to sing along with this song. However, we put our music to it because we thought we had to include it in the repertoire. It's called A Rebel Song. Come workers sing a rebel song, a song of love and hate. Oh, love unto the lowly and the patriot to the great. The great who trod our fathers down, who steal our children's bread, whose hand of greed is stretched to rob the living and the dead. Then sing a rebel song as we proudly sweep along. And the age long duty that makes for human tears. Our march is nearer done with the setting of the sun. The tyrant's might is passing with the passing of the years. We sing no song of wailing, no song of sighs or tears. Our, our, our hopes and styled our hearts and banished all our fears. Our flag is raised above us so that all the world may see. Tis labor's faith and labor's arm alone can labor free. And sing our rebel song as we proudly sweep our love. When the age long tyranny that makes for human tears, our march is nearer done with its setting of the sun. And the tyrant's might is passing with the passing of the years. Out from the depths of misery, we march with hearts of flame. But with wrath against the rulers, false who wreck our man whose name. The serf who licks his tyrant's rod may bend for giving me. The slave who breaks his slavery's chain, a wrathful man must be. Then sing our rebel song as we proudly sweep our love. When the age long tyranny that makes for Marches onward with its face towards the dawn, and just securing that one thing the slave may lean upon. The might within the arm of him who knowing freedom's worth strikes home the banished tyranny from off the face of earth, and sing our rebel song as we proudly sweep our love. And the age long tyranny that makes for human tears. Our march is nearer done with its setting of the sun. And the tyrant's might is passing with passing the years. And the tyrant's might is passing with the passing of the years. <laughs>
this next one had uh, no music with it as well, but the poetry was so lovely we uh, thought it had to be included. So Alan Burke wrote the music, and um, this song is called Sirsha Ruin, which in Irish means cherished freedom. Uh, Connolly wrote all his lyrics in English, but he was a supporter of the I Irish language movement, as he saw it uh, as a, a weapon in the struggle against British imperialism. In fact, interestingly enough, prior to his uh, being won over to that position, he actually supported the spread of Esperanto. As a true internationalist, he wanted a language that was owned by none and shared by all. But in the, obviously he recognized that it was, it was necessary to unite the Irish people to free themselves. And so I, he, I'm sure that is the reason that he, he wrote this title, um, Searsha Ruin. the fact that uh, Jim Lane deserves a great deal of credit because he took it upon himself to over many years assemble many of these songs which appeared neither in Songs of Freedom or in the Dublin, the 1919 Souvenir Songbook. And he found them in 
disused copies in the Cork Library of the Workers' Republic, the Harp, various other newspapers and periodicals that Connolly had edited. And so we don't even know if they were intended to be sung or just to be read, what, what they actually were intended to be. But Jim put them together in the James Connolly songbook and we turned them into songs. So this is called When Labor Calls. This 
next one had to be included, as you'll soon find out why. But it also had a difficulty because it's got one of the hardest lines in the English language to sing. From theft's thick mask of fraud and lies, strip all the specious gilding. <laughs> now that's a real mouthful, even when you don't have to sing it. And since the rest of the text is so militant and so uh, full of fire, it had to be put to a tempo or a, a, a musical accompaniment that respected and gave expression to these lyrics. So that was the challenge. This is called Slaves of Toil. When a man shall stand erect at last and drink at wisdom's fountain and to the earth in scorn shall cast the chains his limbs are bound in. And then from his loins a race shall spring fit peer of gods and heroes. Oh, blessed be they whose efforts bring that day an hour more near us. Oh, slaves of toils, no crave on fear, no dread of fair disasters. And they dash now, then no. Lords and Masters. Like brazen serpent raced on high, an Israelite tradition, our cause and each believing I mean slavery's abolition. We see the day when man shall rise and firm on science building from theft, thick mask of fraud and lies, strip all the specious gilding. No crave on fear, no dread of all disaster. Need she now the map of the Our lords and masters. Oh, bless the day whom wind and tide are whipped in fortune's graces, and bless the man who blushing bright returns his wrapped embraces and blessed is he who has a friend to shield his name when slandered but blessed are all they who contend and march in freedom's vanguard a slaves of toil no crave on fear no dread of one also had no uh, music accompaniment to it but it does need to be set in a context since this was I'm <laughs> almost certain from from the from the content of the lyrics that this was written uh, after World War one had begun because uh, Connolly was very uh, adamant about the fact that the so-called war for civilization which is what the British called what uh, you know in, in their words what they were doing slaughtering millions of people uh, in, in this war between imperial powers, uh, Connolly decried as, a, as a, a bloodbath and posed against it the war for liberation of the working people of the world. And um, it's very clear because he says, when the war flags of labor saluting the light of freedom for mankind around us doth stream. And he's, he's contrasting these two kinds of war, a war of of uh, really of just mass extinction and in a in a war of liberation. This is called Shake Out Your Banners. And again, it has a very tiny little chorus to sing along with Shake Out Your Banners. Just sing with me. Come shake out 
your banners and forth to the fight. Joy, joy to our heart that this day we have seen. For when the war flags of labor salute in the light of freedom for the mankind around us the stream. Oh, the tyrants may quake less the blood they have poured over the fields of the earth, their crowns to be gemmed, may rise to our thoughts as we unsheath the sword, and harden our hearts against the spoilers of man. Shake out your banners, shake out your banners, shake out your banners, shake out your banners, shake out your banners. But not as of yore When brothers go about the hurry and murderous few Or the nod of a tyrant Rush nations to war And the hopes of our race were overwhelmed in blood Nay, the fight that we fight is a fight for our own and Freedom for labor, our worst toxin shall be Through the broad earth resounding to capital throne Lies shattered for I am the toiler is free Shake out your banner 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 Shake out your banners. 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 Now this next song was not written by James Connolly. It was written by another Irish poet by the name of Jim Connell. And it had already been uh, widely circulated by the time Songs of Freedom was published. In fact, it was written in 1896 or 1897. And it was quite popular amongst the wor uh, workers in England, Ireland, and Scotland, and perhaps in the United States as well. Connolly included it in Songs of Freedom, and we wanted to do it as well. But as soon as we encountered, we, as soon as we chose to do this song in the, in the, in the CD, uh, we realized we had a small problem. And the problem was that we had a multinational band of Irish, American, and Swiss musicians. And for the Swiss musicians, this was a, a little bit difficult because this militant uh, revolutionary anthem was sung to the tune of O Tannenbaum. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a bit kitsch for, for Swiss people, so or at least some Swiss people. So we had to go to Detroit to give it a Motown feel. This is the red flag. The people's flag is steep as red. It's shrouded up and air their limbs grew stiff and cold their hearts blood died it's every fold had raised the sky Many a deed and bow We must not change its color now And raise the scarlet standard high Within its shade we live and die The cowards flinch and traitors sneer We will keep the red flag flying here 
has arisen a number of times, sort of two questions. One question was, what was the music that Connolly encountered when he came to America? There was obviously plenty of music being sung. And the other question was, uh, did Connolly know Joe Hill? Since they were contemporaries, uh, Connolly was actually in the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, and it's a good question which no one actually knows the answer to at the moment. Perhaps some researcher will discover it. But there is some evidence, uh, as you'll find in the, in the book back there, which we hope you'll take home with you. <coughs> there is a picture of Connolly with Big Bill Haywood, who is the leader of the Western Federation of Miners. And perhaps more significant was that in 1911, after Connolly had gone back to Ireland, um, Joe Hill wrote one of the only songs to which he wrote his own music, which was called The Rebel Girl. And it was dedicated to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who had in fact toured with Connolly on his first tour in 1902. And, um, and she writes about that in her autobiography. And, in, and further, the Connolly family and the Flynn family were neighbors in the Bronx when they lived in New York. So there is some evidence uh, that there was a, a direct personal connection in any way they were in any case they were both shot by the authorities so there has to be a connection and uh, this is the the rebel girl by Joe Hill Charms made of diamond and pearl But the only thoroughbred lady Is the rebel girl She's the rebel girl The rebel girl to the working class She's the strength of this world From Maine to Georgia you'll see Her fighting for you and for me Yes, she's there by your side with the courage and pride and the workers right then are on furled. And I'm proud to fight for freedom with the rebel girl. Yes, her hands may be hard and 
her dress may not be very fine But a heart in her bosom is beating That is true to her class and her kind And the bosses know that they can change her She's died to defend the workers' world Yes, the only and thoroughbred lady is the rebel girl. She's the rebel girl, the rebel girl to the working class. She's the strength of this world, a main to Georgia, you'll see. Her fighting for you and for me. Yes, she's there by your side with her courage and pride and the workers' red banner on furl. And I'm proud to fight for freedom with the rebel girl. Yes, I'm proud to fight for freedom with the rebel girl. Another song that uh, is closely related in certain ways to Connolly um, was actually uh, written by a uh, poet named by James, by the name of James Oppenheim, to commemorate the Lawrence textile strike in 1911. Um, and this is imp important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to keep in mind that Connolly was a feminist and uh, that the, uh, one of his most famous quotes, famous enough to have John Lennon quote it on a Dick Cavett show in 1972, um, basically is, uh, the worker is the slave of the capitalist society, the female worker is the slave of that slave. None so well, well fitted to break the chains as they who wear them, none so well equipped to decide what is a fetter. In its march towards freedom, the working class must cheer on the efforts of those women who, feeling on their souls and bodies the fetters of the ages, have arisen to strike them off, and cheer all the louder if in its hatred of thraldom and passion for freedom, the women's army forges ahead of the militant army of labor. That's the full statement from Connell. Um, so this is one of the relevances of this song. The other is that when Connolly returned to, to Ireland and formed the Irish Labour Party as the political wing of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, he took as his symbol, the symbol of the party, the title of this song, Bread and Roses. And the final detail is that Mimi Farina wrote music to this text without knowing that there was actually music written to it at the time. We're doing Mimi's version. This is called Bread and Roses. Marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill of gray, a touch with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses. For the people hear us singing, bed in roses, bed in roses. Roses. As we go marching, marching, unnumbered women did go crying through our singing at their ancient call for bread, small art and love and beauty. That their drudging spirits knew. Yes, it's bread that we fight for, but we fight for roses too. As we go marching, marching, we bring the greater days. The rising of the women amidst the rising of the race. No more confession that night at ten that toil the one reposes, but a shadow of the life's glories 
bed and roses, bed and roses. Oh, I shall not be sweated, I'm burned until I'm closed. I saw as well as others, bed and roses, bed and roses. And before returning for the last of the Connolly songs, we have to pay homage to Pete Seeger, who carried on Connolly. This is a song I'm sure everybody knows. singing these songs, Pete and James Connolly will never die. Um, this is uh, the last of the, of, of the songs we're going to do tonight, and it's a special song by Connolly, which again we did not know there was music to, but um, we found out there was in the, in the souvenir program. But I was even more <laughs> informed or convinced when a woman came up to me in Edinburgh at the book launch there, uh, I would say in her 60s, perhaps retired, but she said, you know, I, I, I like your version, but it's, it's not the original. And I, I said, I know that. I found that out after we wrote the music. And, uh, and I said, do you know the original? She said, sure. We used to sing it in our union meetings. And she sang it for me right there on the spot, a cappella. So I know that workers sang these songs, and uh, I hope that they will continue to do so into the future. This is called Watchword of Labor. Oh, hear ye the watch 
watchword of labor, the slogan of they who be free, that no more to any enslaver must labor been supply and need. That we on whose shoulders are born the pomp and the pride of the great, whose toil we pay with their scorn must challenge and master our fate. Then send it aloft on the breeze, boys, that watchword the grandest we know, that labor must rise from its knees, boys, and claim the broad earth as its own. I, we who walk one by our valor, Empire for our rulers and lords, yet knelt in our basement and squalor to the thing we had made by our swords. Now valor with birth will be pending when answering neighbor's command. We rise from our knees and ascending to manhood for freedom takes stay. Then send it aloft on the breeze, boys, that watchword the grandest we know. The band playing for you tonight on guitar, Matt Callahan. And on vocals too, of course. My name is Yvonne Moore. Thank you so much for coming on. Then out from the field in the city, from workshop, from mill, and from mine, despising their wrath and their pity, we workers are moving in line to answer the watchword and token that labor gives forth as its own. No pause till our fetters we broken and conquered the spoiler and road. Then send it aloft on the breeze, boys, that watchword. And claim the broader that's its own. Then send it aloft on the breeze, boys. That watchword the grandest we know. That labor must rise from its knees, boys. And claim the broader as its Thank you to Jake and all the folks at Washington Black and to uh, Workers United. Workers must unite.